Hello, and welcome to Coping with COVID, a podcast and video series jointly produced by the Bolch Judicial Institute at Duke Law School and the American Law Institute. This series examines the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the legal system. I am David Levy, the director of the Bolch Judicial Institute and president of the American Law Institute. I'm joined today by four wonderful leaders at companies that are on the front lines of this pandemic. Ken Frazier is the CEO and former general counsel at Merck and Company. Ken is a member of the Council of the American Law Institute. Melanie Murthy is Vice President and Chief Deputy Council, General Counsel of Medtronic. Melanie is a member of the Leadership Council of the Bolch Judicial Institute and a member of the ALI. Ivan Fong is Senior Vice President, General Counsel and Secretary for 3M and a member of the Council of the ALI. And Kate Adams is General Counsel and Senior Vice President of Legal and Global Security at Apple. Kate is a member of the ALI and has also been uh, very much involved with Bolch Institute programs. What a distinguished and capable group you are, and thank you for taking time today to talk with us about the challenges your companies are facing and the many, many legal issues that you may have to deal with as we work our way through this pandemic. Ken, I'll start with you. You have, you have said in the past that a person's zip code is more determinative of their health than their genetic code. Are we seeing this in the context of COVID? And how can Merck and others help to address these kinds of health disparities in the midst of this emergency? Thank you, David. We are definitely seeing this play out in very vivid ways in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic which is exacerbating health disparities in a number of ways. So first of all, chronic conditions like hypertension, diabetes, COPD, and cancer increase the risk that an infected person will develop the more severe disease manifestations. And these chronic conditions are frankly more common in people of color and those in lower socioeconomic classes. Uh, New York City publishes a map every day of where the COVID-19 virus is striking uh, more or less across the landscape in New York City, and it absolutely uh, correlates with income. You can see certain areas of the Bronx, certain areas of Queens, certain areas of Brooklyn, et cetera, uh, where the number of cases is significantly higher. A lot of it's because of the crowded conditions people face but a major part of it is the underlying health disparities that already existed in our society. Then moving on, you have people like gig workers and self-employed workers and other lower wage workers who are often uninsured or underinsured before the pandemic. And many are now unemployed or have lost their health insurance coverage. So they're not even getting the basic care they need for other conditions, including, for example, vaccinations for pneumonia. Uh, some people feel uh, they simply cannot afford to stay at home when they're sick or exposed to COVID-19. So they're not diagnosed early and they can spread the illness to other family members or contacts. So I think overall, it's really clear that one zip code is much more likely to lead to severe illness and death with this. And what, uh, what if anything, this is sort of more, more in the area of national policy, but how can Merck and, and other companies help uh, address these kinds of disparities and, and the, the situation more generally? Yeah. So first of all, our main priority right now as it relates to COVID is supporting research and development efforts for antivirals, immunotherapies, and vaccines to help end the pandemic and its devastating uh, consequences. But we also are active, uh, you know, in local areas. All health care is provided locally. So we're active in a lot of areas, trying to ensure that the people who are seeing these patients are very mindful of what I said at the very beginning, which is if people show it with chronic conditions like hypertension or diabetes, the risk that they're going to get seriously ill and have to proceed to an ICU or a ventilator is much greater. So we have been working on this issue. I'll just give one example. We, we gave uh, to the UN a couple of years ago 
to try to do something about a maternal mortality. Again, in New York City, an African-American woman is like 10 times more likely to die than a white counterpart in childbirth. And that has to do with the disparities in how healthcare is provided as well as those underlying conditions. Thank you. Kate, turning to Apple, I've, I, I've read that Apple is getting involved in contact tracing, and I'm sure that there are lots and lots of decisions that, uh, that surround uh, this decision. It must be very complicated, probably very interesting. Can you tell us how the company decided to get involved with this and what mm -hmm. some of the considerations are as you move into this space? Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, we're, we're really um, just delighted that we've been able to work uh, with, with Google on this, this, this project. And um, this came together uh, very, very quickly as the need to um, assist public health authorities in identifying exposures uh, has become one of the critical mechanisms to prevent the spread of the virus as we attempt to reopen the economy and in, in you know outside of china um, so this came together very quickly and contact tracing um, we we also refer to it increasingly as exposure notification uh, which is probably a more precise way of describing what what our our um, um, apis will do um, it's something that governments have used for years to help spread the slow of pandemics and at a high level, uh, contact tracing is the identification and follow up with people who may have come into contact with someone with an infectious disease so that public health authorities can appropriately notify, isolate, test, or treat them. Um, so right now, public health authorities rightly are exploring the use of digital technology to aid in these contact tracing efforts, but there have been a number of challenges. And probably the most important one that we've tried to solve uh, working with Google is fragmentation and what's referred to as lack of interoperability um, across different operating systems. So of course, Apple runs, for example, the iPhones on iOS and Google provides the Android platform. Um, there are also things, um, more technical things underlying this like power and performance uh, that can be impacted when you use Bluetooth, um, which is a near uh, a near um, a, a, a uh, tool that allows you to um, show close contact as opposed to wider, more disparate contact. It allows you to to show more clearly and precisely who has come into contact with who. Um, and when that's running in the background constantly, it drains devices of power. Uh, and so it's not really very, uh, very appealing um, to use it for this purpose. Plus, there's also privacy concerns, as you might imagine, with amassing a lot of personal data and centralizing it in a way that could, uh, large uh, others could have access to in an unconstrained way. So what happened is the COVID-19 situation began to escalate. Our engineering team started to think about how we could assist the public health authorities in their contact tracing efforts. Uh, their focus was on building an interoperable framework that would allow users to be notified um, in the event of an exposure, but also building in strong privacy protections and needing to do that across the Android and iOS uh, environments, because if you don't have both of them, it really, it's not going to be very effective because you're going to have a, such a, you're going to have the world fragmented into two populations. Um, each essentially two populations using the two platforms. So we began talking to Google and that led to the announcement we, we made about two weeks ago about our notification framework. Um, and I can give a quick summary of the framework if you're interested. I don't want to take too much sure. time. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Um, yeah, but so this is how it works. Um, a user installs a public health authority app and understand that those apps are designed by the public health authorities they control how they um, decide what information is relevant from a public health perspective. Apple, speaking for us, I believe Google would say the same thing. We don't pretend to know that. Uh, we're not the health experts. Um, we, we're providing the technology to allow this information to be shared. Um, with the user's consent, and this, that's extremely important, um, it will not work without their consent. Their device would use Bluetooth to beacon a random identifier that changes every 10 to 20 minutes. These identifiers are generated on device, uh, which is a much more secure and private um, te technique to do this. And it does not include location or otherwise identifiable information. 
the device also receives and securely stores random identifiers from that are broadcast from other devices around. So if we were sitting in the same area, of course, unfortunately, we're not because we're here uh, all sitting in isolation, but our devices would be letting us know that we were near one another, but in a, but in a de-identified way. And then once a day, the device downloads a, a list of the random identifiers for any of the individuals who have used the, the public health app to report that they have been uh, diagnosed with COVID-19. Um, now, that's very important because that is also the choice of the user to provide that information via public health app. Um, and, and so built into, our, into the API is the consent requirement for that information as well. Um, and the individual also has to consent to sharing their random identifier uh, with the public health authority. So the, the device is then capable, and again, on device, not on a server, of matching those two pieces of information and letting an individual know that they have come into contact with some unidentified person um, at, to a degree that indicates they should seek medical, uh, medical assistance. And the app, the public health authority will tell the user what to do at that point. So it's quite, I think, really quite innovative and um, really a remarkable way of getting important information into the public domain with privacy and security at the forefront. Yeah, sounds interesting. Uh, and then I take it you can, you can restrict it in, in some way, or maybe the Bluetooth does, so that it, the contacts are more, that, more than, oh, gee, I was in the general vicinity of somebody because that might, uh, that might just freak you out, but you, you wouldn't really be at any risk. Yeah, and, and what's happening now is public health authorities across the world are, are designing their apps with, with those health indicators built in. And we, you know, we're, we defer, of course, to them what they consider to be a sufficiently proximate uh, um, exposure and of sufficient duration. And so my, you know, it might, for example, only notify you if you are within six feet for more than 15 minutes. I just made that up, but. Yeah, but something like that. There'll be a parameter Right. that will keep it from being an overbroad communication. Um, well, we might come back to that because it's sort of uh, marrying up what, what Ken was talking about and what you are talking about. It's not a perfect match. You know, if, uh, if, the, if the virus is intense and uh, intensely located in certain communities or the impact is in those communities and those communities are not uh, as likely to have uh, uh, iPhones or the, the the Google equivalent than an Android, then um, then we don't well we don't have perfect coverage, and that's not what you're what you're describing. Yeah, anymore. yeah, and you're, then you're relying on traditional contact tracing right. using person to person um, information communication. So let's turn to Ivan. Ivan, you 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 have a, such a remarkable career. You've been general counsel at a gigantic federal agency, Homeland Security, and now you're at 3M, and uh, I think you're in the best position to give some good advice uh, on crisis management to uh, other general counsels uh, in the corporate and government sectors. And what would that advice be? Well, thank you, David. And um, it's an honor to be part of this uh, distinguished program, uh, as you said. Um, so for better or worse, I, I have had the privilege, I suppose, of um, dealing with a number of crises. I would say each one is different. Um, but there may be some elements um, that could translate uh, more generally. So um, I'll try to extract a few things that, that I've learned. First, I'd say it's important to stay calm and collected. A crisis uh, requires clear and strategic thinking. I think that goes without saying, um, and that it's harder when everybody is stressed because of the crisis. Uh, the good news is that generally uh, this is a strength of lawyers and legal professionals, uh, perhaps because of our training or our professional uh, culture or ethos. Uh, second, uh, one of the first things to do is to stand up a crisis action team. This is a group of people who meet uh, frequently, especially in the early days of a crisis. Uh, to make plans and uh, tee up decisions for, for decision makers. Uh, it's important to get the right people in the room, not too many and not too few. Um, and one of the lessons I've learned is to separate facts from speculation. 
Uh, I once had somebody at the Department of Homeland Security say, salt away the facts, uh, which is something that I, uh, is, is a memorable phrase. Um, I have found that the fog of war is real. And as uh, I think it was Donald Rumsfeld who, who said, you know, separate the known knowns from the known unknowns. And you may not even have time to think about the unknown unknowns uh, uh, in the beginning. Part of crisis preparation is to make sure that your crisis action team actually has worked together before. They know each other. There's an, a level of trust, and that is a, a key uh, learning that um, make sure you practice and you exercise uh, this team together so that they know how to handle uh, even the basics of remote communication and uh, the complexity of decision making. Uh, under pressure and with imperfect information. And then finally, this team is um, tasked with uh, doing scenario planning. Uh, think about what needs to be done immediately um, and what needs to be done depending on how the uh, facts and the crisis plays itself out. Third, I would say this is a moment for leadership. Uh, leaders need to establish clear priorities for the organization. Uh, principally, you know, uh, typically it'll be protecting the health and safety of the people in the organization. Uh, I once, um, one of the former 3M CEOs I worked with uh, said there are two essential tasks of a leader uh, to confront reality and to provide hope. I think those are two top of mind um, uh, 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 mind things that that leaders should do, and then of course it's important to communicate throughout the organization. Uh, there's going to be a hunger for information uh, within the organization and externally, so communicating with candor to build trust, showing compassion and empathy for those impacted by the crisis, and then finally, sort of personal advice. Um, it's, it's critical to pace yourself. Uh, some of these crises can play out over many weeks and months as, as this one has. So it, I, I've been reminding you know, our leadership team to take care of themselves, to, to, to you know, take care of their physical and mental health. Um, there's an old saying, you know, you've got to put on your own oxygen mask before you can help others. Uh, and so if the leadership team uh, is healthy, um, I think it'll be more effective. Uh, so I'll pause there and uh, interested in hearing other perspectives on this because there are many others on this, on this program who've dealt with crises as well. Yeah, well, it sounds like very good advice. I, the, the part about staying healthy and, and um, cool under, under fire. Uh, and I, I do think you're right that lawyers to some extent, lawyers, uh, they thrive on stress, but uh, certainly trial lawyers are used to coping with stress. And you, we all have had to learn how to exhale uh, from time to time and, and know that we don't do our best work when we're running around uh, in, in multiple different directions and, and fear takes over. Uh, what we, we, can, we can come back to that in a moment. Uh, Melanie, uh, so here, here's a topic that's much on everybody's mind. Uh, you know, people are wondering about supply chains and why isn't there, why aren't there more paper products? And uh, why, you know, uh, probably people are more focused on paper products than anything else, but ventilators are very high mm -hmm. on the list and Medtronic makes ventilators. I'm not sure that we're so focused on ventilators anymore, but we were very focused on them at least uh, a few weeks ago. And so, all of a sudden, Medtronic is faced with a world where the demand for ventilators just shoots through the roof. And can you tell us what's involved when a, when a company all of a sudden experiences this surge of demand, uh, intense demand for a, for a product that, um, that really it, it, it didn't, it did, had no reason to expect? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, David, for including me with this very august group. Um, during this COVID-19 crisis, we've gone from being known as a pacemaker company to a ventilator company. Uh, I think a lot of the things that Ivan said 
um, were very much in place for us, which I think has helped us navigate the issue. Um, and a couple of things that are foundational. One is um, we have a very, very strong mission. And in fact, I think um, this has only crystallized and deepened that commitment. Um, it's core principle being um, alleviating pain, uh, restoring health and extending life. And then the second is very early on, our leadership made very crystal clear that our priorities were our people closely followed by patients and our communities. Um, so the ventilator issue just fit right in that. And with that kind of foundation, I think we were prepared to, to address it. Um, and I am really grateful that touch wood so far, um, while a lot of people have feared uh, a ventilator shortage, uh, so far it hasn't materialized um, in any significant way, and I hope that continues to be the case. Um, with respect to ventilators, it really, you know, breaking it down, three principal areas. One's the production, right, tying into the manufacturing and supply and maintaining the supply chain. For us, it was increasing production, um, but it wasn't just about what we were doing. Um, it was also about our suppliers. And both instances, maintaining employee safety uh, was critical and paramount. Um, and another part of that is we were also facing um, shelter in place, shutdown orders, really globally. And so ensuring that we fell within the definition of essential services um, was very critical. Uh, our government affairs team and legal, but really here our govern government affairs team has been um, critical to ensuring that um, lo um, lobbying and dealing with governments uh, to, make, to pave the way um, where needed. Uh, the second is fair allocation. And in the absence of governments really working with each other to ensure that we were fairly allocating ventilators, um, it really has um, fell upon us to identify a methodology, um, data-based, that is based on high risk and high need. And so that's the, the second part. And then the third was trying to be innovative. And I think the most innovative thing we did was open sourcing uh, the design specifications and IP in general for uh, one of our ventilators, the PP560. And we chose that one because it was one that easily could be replicated essentially, or people could take those design specs um, that uh, and pot potentially uh, do something with it. And legal, of course, played a critical role there because it's um, we developed a permissive pers permissive license um, that, you know, did what it needed to do to protect Medtronic, um, but also uh, paves the way for other companies to manufacture and sell the product. So interesting. Uh, could we um, follow up on Ivan's point that uh, you, you, you need a crisis management team that has some experience with one another? Uh, to kind of pay, to get you through a crisis like this. I'd just be interested, uh, Ken and, and Kate and, and Melanie, um, do, do each one of your companies, do they have such a thing, Ken? Absolutely. We have in place a crisis management team, which has handled n a number of crises. Last year, we ended up having uh, a, a different kind of virus, a computer virus, which almost shut down our entire global operations. And so if we didn't have in place a team of people who have both the familiarity with each other and the ability to work together, but also the empowerment to make quick decisions, we wouldn't be able to handle this. And so my senior um, team, uh, the most senior team in Merck has delegated to a cross-divisional emergency management team, many aspects of how we're gonna handle our operations in this pandemic, also, a lot of the day-to-day -day communications that are necessary to keep people informed are delegated to that team. And I think if we didn't have that team in place, if they were not familiar with one another, if they did not have a set of standard operating procedures, 
we would be running around uh, sort of like chickens with our heads cut off. Yeah. Kate? Yes, we, we also, um, I think as all of, all of these wonderful companies do, have a, an existing crisis management staff and team. And actually, this, this is a, a, on a scale that we did not obviously anticipate, but we have had quite a few things that we have had to weather from a crisis perspective, mostly more regional issues. Um, you know, for example, the earthquake in Japan um, had a big impact on, on people in that area. I mean, you can think of a lot of examples over the past five, five to 10 years of, of situations that had a more localized effect. And so the, 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 the team has had, um, you know, unfortunately good, <laughs> some good opportunities to, um, you know, to, to learn to work together though, again, on, a, on something that is less uh, broad based than this has been. Um, we, we, so we have a, a professional staff that's responsible for this, but it's, it, it, it's all done at the direction of the, of the functional business leaders. And, and so they operationalize uh, and try to coordinate the response. But for example, at the end of the day, anything on the legal front would be my responsibility or on the security front. And similarly, you know, financial matters still roll up to the, to the CFO, but we have we have people who are trained in the organizational and sort of process aspects of this so that we can, so we have the infrastructure to do the things that we need to do quickly and uh, with clear lines of authority. Melanie, I think you said you have such a team. We do. And I think is that preparation and having that in place is critical. Like Kate, I mean, and I'm sure like um, for Ken and for Ivan, um, this isn't our first one, unfortunately. And, you know, we've had both the natural disasters as well as other issues um, that uh, we've had to address. So having that playbook in place, I think is critical. I also think with respect to COVID, this has been an unfolding one. Um, we really, you know, started to address and react as soon as the issue emerged in China. Uh, we're a global company. We have significant Chinese operations, um, a large employee base there. So we had seen this. I mean, some of our employees have been um, sheltering in place now since January. And we have employees who've been displaced. Um, I have colleagues who haven't been able to return to China since January. So when you think about that, you know, I think we've really been addressing it and at that point itself increased our bandwidth, for example. I, I think it would have been impossible to continue to operate in the way we've been able to without doing something as might seem, it's not minor, right? Uh, but uh, that people don't necessarily automatically think of. Let's talk about uh, employees. I, I know that uh, the safety of your workforce is, is extremely important um, to, to all of you. Uh, but let's focus on, uh, on, on looking forward. So uh, we're, we need to get back to work, uh, uh, whether it's the tomorrow or the next day or the next month or the next six months, whatever you think the right time frame is. Uh, at some point or another, you're going to be asking people to come back to work and some of them are not going to be altogether too sure whether uh, your, your time frame is the same as their time frame, and there's steps you're going to want to take. And I'm wondering how uh, any of you are, are thinking and planning uh, for this day when, when people are back to work. Many of your people maybe are at work, and so you have some basis for, uh, for going forward. Um, any of you um, want to take that one? Ivan, are you ready? Sure, I'll, I'll start. Uh, uh, every company is um, thinking about this and, and making plans. So um, I think what I'm about to say may not be unique, uh, um, but, uh, but it's a start. So I think the, the overarching principle is that people won't return to the workplace unless and until they feel safe um, to do so. Um, many of our production workers, uh, like others, um, are not able to work remotely. And so uh, they've been deemed um, both essential in the fight against uh, COVID-19 um, and 
you know, are working, in fact, 24-7 uh, to produce critical medical supplies, uh, such as the 3M uh, N95 respirators. Um, we have ramped up production as well. We saw this early, given our experience, uh, both with prior pandemics like SARS and H1N1, uh, uh, as well as what was happening uh, in China. So uh, for those uh, employees, you know, we are practicing uh, physical distancing so that they, you know, their workstations are farther apart, uh, alternative work arrangements with barriers uh, between them, staggering the shift so that they're not all um, uh, uh, coming to work at the same time, uh, obviously stringent cleaning protocols, uh, making sure they have the right personal protective equipment. Uh, with respect to others, um, uh, obviously we've all been, or many of us have been working from home uh, if we are able. And for them, we have a framework that envisions a phased return process, uh, multiple phases in fact. So groups of uh, employees will return uh, depending on uh, what the uh, situation uh, looks like. And, and the framework, has a, a list of sort of internal and external factors, uh, factors that include health data, right? How is the virus um, propagating or, or how, what kind of community spread there is? Um, what are the regional and local government requirements, whether they're decrees or recommendations? Uh, and third, operational considerations. Can we ensure a safe work environment uh, whether through social distancing, uh, personal hygiene practices, enhanced cleaning protocols, uh, self-monitoring for symptoms. So there's a whole array of things that have to happen before um, we're going to allow the first few phases of uh, people to return to the work site. And each site will be different. We're a global company. All of these factors need to be site-specific and localized. And then you, you alluded to an important consideration, which, which are the personal circumstances that I think are going to be relevant. Uh, there are some people for whom they have childcare needs, they may have health factors, you know, their overall comfort level may not be uh, where it needs to be for them to return to the workplace. And for them, we want to make sure that we are providing flexibility and um, giving people choice that if you want to continue to work from home and you're able to do so, I think that's going to be fine. And, and we envision a future workplace where uh, the, the workplace may well be different from, from what we've been used to. Well, the intersection of, of privacy and probably some of the labor laws uh, and, and perfection here uh, it's, it's not easy. And what I'm thinking about is testing. I mean, you might want to say, gee, uh, we're going to take a temperature of everybody before they, they enter into the workplace or uh, we'll have periodic testing. But, uh, but that could become problematic, I suppose. Uh, if you tell somebody they have to go home because their temperature is raised of, of, of someone, and, um, they may not think that's fair. Uh, it, I'm sure you're, you've got a lot of people working through this stuff, outside counsel. Um, is, is testing the, the, the most complex part of dealing with employees uh, uh, or are there other issues as well? Anybody? I think it touches upon it. I think it's the balancing fundamentally, right, between what you need to do to protect public health, the health of your employees, um, with this encroachment on individual freedom, right? And it's, it's that tension. And I think it is going to be a risk-based analysis. There's been some relaxation of privacy laws, which has helped. So um, we actually have, um, with our manufacturing, already have active screening in place, which includes certain set of questions and uh, you know, a temperature check that you don't touch the individual, but done at the forehead. Um, so, uh, so we already have that in place, but I think for the whole return to office, uh, the big challenge here is we have a virus that people are still trying to figure out the mechanism, 
and I'm so glad that Ken's company is doing the research that it is, um, as well as getting our arms around the contagion effect. And so I think for us, realistically, um, for those people who do not need to be on site, um, we will be working from home um, for the um, foreseeable future. So Ken, you're the CEO in the room, and uh, let me just ask you, when, you, when we go through a, a, a crisis like this, which is uh, in some sense existential for the economy, uh, does, your, does your philosophical point of view change uh, as, you, as you look at your company and the different constituencies that your company has? Uh, you know, we have shareholder value, uh, we, have, we have your workforce, uh, you have the markets, uh, you have your, you, you have a board and, uh, and you're trying to get through this thing as best you can. Uh, do you, do you, do you, do you change your priorities? Absolutely. I, you know, speaking from our perspective, this is an unprecedented challenge for the entire world. And, you know, the idea that we're going to be focusing at this time on short or even long-term profitability doesn't strike me as the right way for a company like Merck to, to operate. So we are investing a significant amount of resources into research around antivirals, around antibiotics that are still necessary because most people are actually dying from bacterial pneumonia. Um, also, importantly, around vaccine research. Uh, we intend to make those medicines and vaccines to the extent that we're successful. And I point out that you know, over 90% of all the uh, medicines and vaccines that we put in humans fail, ultimately. So uh, we're putting a lot of capital at risk for a lot of uh, gain potentially, but we're unlikely to be successful in any of these programs. And so from my perspective, we have to think about society first. We have to think about patients. I think it's important for our shareholders to understand that. And we try to be very clear that we're actually going to be very focused on that going forward. Um, but from, it is a unprecedented global public health emergency. And I'll just say very quickly, because Melanie made this comment, one of the biggest challenges that we have with constituencies is that governments around the world are not cooperating. Science crosses borders, so we need to collaborate across borders. Our supply chains go across borders. Obviously, this pandemic, this virus is not a respecter of borders. And the struggle we often have is in order for us to proceed, for example, with a vaccine program, we might need some IP that's resident in France, or we might need to collaborate with someone in the UK. We're finding particularly European governments throwing up roadblocks for, for the research we want to do, saying, we will help you get this off the ground. We will help you take this risk. But we want some assurance that our population comes first as opposed to thinking about it the way that we would think about it, which is certain populations across borders, let's say, for example, healthcare workers, or those people who are at greater risk of severe illness or death, we would prioritize those people first. But we're now struggling with governments that are really getting ultra-nationalist uh, in this time. Uh, that's such an interesting point. Uh, and I think Melanie referred to it as well, the uh, dealing with government, uh, in the, during a crisis like this must be just uh, so complicated because even just domestically, you have the mayors, then you have the governors, you have the president, you have the legislatures, uh, and then you have probably a lot of other officials who try to get into the act, and they all um, are capable of at least asserting extraordinary powers during a health emergency, and you, you might wake up and find that uh, they think that they can take over your, your production or uh, and I think the president actually has that authority. And so uh, how do you, uh, and, and here we are isolated at home, how do, how do you, uh, and, and Ken, you've just said it's an international problem as well. How, how does a company deal with these uh, possibilities? You might wake up the next, find out you've been nationalized or something in effect, uh, maybe not in the United States, maybe someplace else. Uh, how how do you cope with it? Is that part of your crisis management or is that some other team? Anybody? So absolutely, it's part of our crisis management. The most important thing for us to do is to help 
governments, whether they're international in nature, whether it's the federal government, and the federal government has a very important role to play, in, for example, in ensuring that we have the kind of surge capacity we, we're going to need to make vaccines for hundreds of millions, if not billions of people. We have to help them understand how our business runs uh, to ensure that they don't put artificial roadblocks. We've seen this happen with respect to certain companies like, you know, uh, with respect to 3M, with respect to General Motors, where the government uh, comes in and says, we're going to help you guys be inspired to do what you were already inspired and incentivized to do, which is to save lives. So for us, it's really about making sure that they understand just how difficult it is for us to move uh, from one stage to another in research. You know, we're being pressured to, to develop vaccines at an unprecedented speed uh, and to manufacture and deploy them at an unprecedented scale. And we have to remind people that we have to ensure that those vaccines are proven to be safe and effective before we, you know, inject them into millions of people. I was so just gonna, Ken, I, yeah, Ken, you, oh, you described my life for the last uh, six or seven weeks. Um, as you know, there is in the United States a, uh, a law called the Defense Production Act, uh, which Congress passed uh, soon after the Korean War, uh, that gives the president uh, broad authority, as Ken said, to um, uh, order uh, necessary defense materials, defense uh, articles, needs uh, to be met uh, by, by private industry. Um, so while it's not nationalizing, uh, it is something that uh, many companies have now uh, felt <laughs> the, uh, the brunt of. And uh, as Ken said, you know, we have all along uh, ramped up production. Um, this is a global issue, the fact that uh, the demand for uh, N95 respirators far outstrips the supply. Uh, so it's not as if we were sitting around you know, waiting to, to make more of these uh, critical medical supplies. Uh, we uh, very uh, strongly uh, doubled our production and will be investing to um, add capacity and double again uh, in the next 12 months. So uh, this is something we take very seriously. Um, it is, it is uh, a top priority. Um, and as Ken said, I think the challenge of working with government partners to achieve shared missions is something that re really requires sort of a, uh, an extra layer of, of leadership because uh, not only are you making decisions uh, under pressure with incomplete information, uh, but there's the glare of the media um, not only social media, but just the 24 hour news cycle and managing uh, uh, a situation where there are multiple stakeholder interests um, and um, uh, focusing on sort of not only true to your values, right? Do the right thing, be a responsible corporate citizen, communicate with candor and empathy, uh, but also have that sixth sense of, you know, what does this do to our reputation as a company? What are the optics? Um, how can we look around corners to make sure that our well-intentioned uh, actions uh, are not misconstrued or twisted uh, in the worst case uh, to be used against us? Um, so it, it is very difficult. And, um, uh, you know, our goal remains to uh, serve our customers serve shareholders, serve other stakeholders, um, but just the degree of difficulty and complexity uh, during the current crisis, uh, I think is just, uh, as others have said, it, it's unprecedented. Melanie? I was just gonna add, right, is that that rep reputational management piece is, um, you know, very much part of this and the role of the communications team and I work very, very closely with them. And it's both the internal, because you also have to communicate regularly with your own internal employees, um, but that external management of stakeholders um, is um, significant. And with respect to the government, again, it's that engagement, it is demonstrating the partnership. Um, but I, I do think the lack of understanding of the scientific issues 
the technology, right? I mean, our ventilators, I mean, our, our acute care, critical uh, care ventilator has something like 1,500 parts to it, right? And it's a global supply chain. And so on the one hand, you're trying to address um, this demand that it feels impossible, and I think is where supply outstrips demand. Uh, on the other hand, you are facing increasingly nationalistic orders, uh, which makes sense. I will say, you know, from a containment standpoint, I get it, right? We have to manage that locally. Um, I get it. But from a care and treatment and a solution standpoint, we really have to be thinking global, globally. You know, all of this will be clearer a few years from now when we're <laughs> able to look back on it. But it, it has occurred to me that one of the dangers here is that we get so focused on the virus. And I think maybe Ken kind of alluded to this. There are a lot of other associated conditions that we can actually treat, uh, you know, like heart disease and diabetes and things like that. Uh, that may go untreated and you could end up in a situation where I don't want to say more people but a lot of people uh, die or, or become really uh, sick from uh, illnesses that we can treat because they're too scared to go to the hospital or because everybody's attention is diverted uh, to yeah. COVID um, which maybe we're less able to, to treat in the, the severe cases. I hope that's not, not what, what is happening. Um, are there other challenges out there? I mean, what, what is, that we haven't uh, talked to? If you had to pick one, uh, uh, maybe that's that kind of keeps you up at night. Uh, is there is there is there something uh, else maybe that we haven't haven't touched on? Anybody? Well, no. I can tell you one thing that I worry about, and that is that this particular contagion, this particular virus, I think has is natural in its origin. But I'll go back to just a few years ago when we had concerns about anthrax spores and our government was very much focused on bioterrorism preparedness. I think the one lesson that we have to learn from this is how quickly a virus like COVID-19 can spread around the entire world. And if we're not, we don't have in place the right kind of antivirals, vaccines, antibiotics, antifungals, uh, you know, we can be very, uh, you know, very much subject to those kinds of lessons. I guess what I'm trying to say is this is an evolutionary struggle between our species and these uh, anti uh, and these these microbes that have been around for, you know, billions of years. And it's not clear who wins this in the long run. And we have to be prepared. We can't just scramble when we learn about the next um, infection. So David, I, I have been thinking about um, a couple of challenges that I think are longer term. Um, the umbrella point is that in a crisis, it's easy to manage the urgent. And it's important to remember, we also have to do the important as well. And I think um, three things that are sort of longer term consequences that I, I don't know how will play out. First. Uh, I alluded to this earlier, I do think the long-term impact to people's mental health and wellness, we are just starting to appreciate. Uh, I think with the uh, increased isolation, uh, with uh, unemployment, uh, you know, the economic impacts, um, uh, many people would say that there will be increased instances of depression, of severe anxiety, of substance abuse. And I think long term, not just for our profession, but but for our society generally, uh, we, we will see some some long term consequences. Um, a second thing that I worry about, uh, many of us have uh, long promoted and, and supported diversity and inclusion uh, within our organizations. And I think with the crisis, my hope is that we don't put that uh, on the back seat that we continue to advocate uh, for uh, diversity and inclusion. And I think the intersection of inclusion and well-being and mental health uh, is an important lever that 
uh, as we start returning to a new normal, um, making sure that we keep our eye on inclusion, belonging, making people feel welcomed, uh, valued in their organization. I think that's going to go a long way to um, making sure that people are uh, back to um, uh, positive mental energies and, and mental health. And then the last point that really I think is the hard one, you know, this is going to have a very lasting impact on, on the way people think about the economy. You know, it, it's, I think many, um, I don't want to say orders of magnitude, but, but like people who lived through the depression, but I think it's changed them in ways that uh, we won't really appreciate until um, you know many decades from now. That that there will be things that we will do as a generation uh, that that our children and grandchildren will look at and say, "What? Why do you do that?" And and we will say, "Well, it's because when you live through a pandemic, uh, this is how we. Why do you wash your hands so much? You know? <laughs> well, you know that's just something we learn to do." You know, David, just taking that, that the, your question and um, maybe thinking about it from the positive uh, perspective, I do think there's some things I hope will come out of this for us as humankind. Um, one is a newfound appreciation for, um, you know, our frontline people who are doing critical work in this time that might have in the past been considered mundane or menial activities are people that are working in grocery stores, people who are picking up the garbage, people who are doing, um, you know, coming, coming out of their homes and not socially isolating in order to keep the fabric of society um, from unraveling. Um, you know, if, if all the first responders, of course, the medical profession, which, you know, I think, you know, has been underappreciated, deeply underappreciated in many ways. Um, and so I, you know, I do, I do, my, my, my uh, optimistic side of me says that we will learn from this and have a deeper respect, you know, and for teachers, for example, as parents are now homeschooling and realizing, oh my gosh, it's so hard to be an educator. Uh, you know, the other, the other uh, vector that has been alluded to in some of the conversations about government is, I, I, I think the, um, that we're developing a much needed respect for facts and for science. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the um, respect that Dr. Fauci, uh, for example, uh, you know, has, has commanded is a, you know, one, one example of this. People are gravitating toward those who can speak with authority, with knowledge, with candor, and um, as a, you know, a beacon of, of truth and, and a path forward, you know, in, in, a, in a very ambiguous environment. And I, 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 I hope that that becomes something that we embrace for the long haul and not just in the immediate term. Well, just, can are... I just follow up on that, Please. David? Yes. Which is, I agree. And I also think that um, the role of data, um, artificial intelligence, um, predictive analytics, in particular in healthcare, which I think we've been behind in, uh, I think will now accelerate. I think people recognize its importance and I think there'll be some balancing and maybe leveling again in terms of privacy, right? Where how can we anonymize the data? What can we do to leverage it but still protect um, individual privacy. I think there will be some balancing there. Um, we're also seeing, you know, I, I do think there's going to be some transformative things in healthcare in terms of telehealth, remote monitoring, things like that. I share some of the concerns that, um, actually all of the concerns that Ivan's raised. I will say there have been some silver linings for us in this because um, this has been the great equalizer in the professional environment. I totally recognize that while we're in the same storm, we're all in different boats and how we're experiencing it. But what I mean is in terms of, I feel we've accelerated in the, in the inclusion space because, and we've got a much 
and we've also accelerated our global outlook um, because by having everyone work virtually, um, it, it really has level set us in, in many ways. So I think there's some positive outgrowth and I think it's also going to transform business travel. I think the fact that we can function as seamlessly as we have, I don't mean to suggest it hasn't been difficult, but I've been um, surprised at how easily people switched the way they operate, certainly for our company, um, and that it's been relatively seamless. It doesn't mean it hasn't been difficult, but I think so. This is going to have some transformative effects in how we work. Well, you get the last word, and I, uh, I think what all of you are saying is that we can't afford any longer the kind of divisiveness that we've had in our society. It's kind of a, maybe it's a, it's a luxury uh, we can't afford uh, to make a big deal out of little issues when you see these big picture uh, kinds of threats, uh, as Ken said, to actually to our, our species, but more in the short term, just an appreciation of of what everybody what everybody does and you see this in a in a crisis situation i experienced it when i was a judge picking juries when you hear from people just from every walk of life you realize how valuable every everybody is to the shared endeavor of trying to build a fair and just society and raise your family and just um, lead a good life and and so many people do that at, at all levels so thank you, all of you, so much. We're, we're so lucky to have leadership like, like, uh, like you involved uh, in, in, in dealing with this terrible pandemic. And we're so proud uh, from the ALI and Bolch Judicial Institute to have uh, the four of you as, as friends and, and colleagues. The challenges you face are staggering, uh, but hearing your, your thoughtfulness, your vision, your determination, uh, your, your innovativeness, um, you're, you're meeting these challenges. And uh, as Ivan says, you're, you're looking at reality, but you're also giving us some hope and confidence uh, in the future. And I wish you all good luck. I hope you get plenty of sleep and exercise. Thank you for all you are doing uh, to help us fight this, this, this uh, terrible problem uh, to make our communities safer and healthier. This has been Coping with COVID, a podcast and video series produced by the Bolch Judicial Institute at Duke Law School and by the American Law Institute. I'm David Levy. Thanks for joining us.